The BBC News and Reporting Scotland with Hugh Edwards and Sally Magnuson. It's six o'clock. Guilty as charged, Dr Harold Shipman is convicted of 15 murders. Shipman is now the biggest convicted mass killer in recent history. But the GP is also suspected of killing dozens more of his patients. How was a trusted family doctor allowed to keep on killing for so long? One other story, dictator General Pinochet could soon be back home in Chile. Also tonight, two psychologically disturbed men have their legs amputated despite the limbs being healthy. The surgeon defends his actions and calls for an investigation into Tayside police amid claims that the force is being mismanaged. Good evening. After six days of deliberating, the jury at Preston Crown Court returned late this afternoon. Harold Chipman, the Manchester family doctor, was found guilty of murdering 15 of his patients, all of them women. He is now the biggest convicted killer in recent legal history. Shipman was given 15 life sentences. The judge said his actions defied description. It's now emerging that Shipman was probably responsible for many more deaths. Nicholas Witchell was in court in Preston to hear the verdict. Nick. This, quite simply, is one of the most shocking stories to emerge from a British court in recent years. It is the story of Harold Frederick Shipman, a family doctor whose duty was to preserve life, but who instead took it. His victims were middle-aged or elderly women. Not one of those with whose murder he was charged was suffering from any serious illness. Yet every one of them died suddenly after a meeting with Dr. Shipman. Fifteen charges of murder were brought. He was convicted on every one of them. But perhaps the most shocking aspect of this case is the number of other cases about which there are serious doubts and serious suspicions. The police have evidence about 146 other such cases. The truth is that only Harold Shipman, the family doctor who turned mass murderer, knows how many people he killed. It was at 4.33, after 34 hours of deliberation and with Shipman looking on from the dock, that the foreman of the jury began reading the verdicts. Fifteen times he said guilty to the charges of murder, guilty also to the charge of forging one of his victim's wills. Shipman, a small figure, pale and anxious, he bit his lip and stared straight ahead, but he did not react. Then the judge, Mr Justice Forbes, passed sentence. Each victim was your patient, he told Shipman. You murdered each and every one by a calculated and cold-blooded perversion of your medical skills. I have little doubt, said the judge, that your victims smiled as they submitted to your deadly mistreatment. The sheer wickedness of what you have done, the judge said, defies description. He sentenced Shipman to 15 concurrent life sentences. And in your case, the judge said, life must mean life. My recommendation, Mr Justice Forbes said, is that you spend the rest of your life in prison. With that, Dr Harold Shipman was taken down to the cells. From the public gallery, where relatives of some of the doctor's victims had been listening, there was a smattering of applause. Before he was sentenced, the court was told of Shipman's previous convictions, how in 1976 he'd forged prescriptions to obtain pethidine for his own use. He was convicted then on eight counts and asked for 74 other offences to be taken into consideration. And yet, after treatment, he was allowed to return to general practice. And most unusually, after he had passed sentence and Shipman had been taken down to the cells without any reaction to the judge's words and to the sentence, the judge, Mr Justice Forbes, removed his wig and spoke directly to relatives of the victims, many of whom were in the public gallery, many of whom had been sobbing during the, the sentencing of Harold Shipman. And the judge's voice noticeably shook with emotion when he spoke about what a very moving case it had been and he talked about what a painful and a very harrowing experience it had been for those relatives, vict victims' uh, families who had given evidence during the case. He paid tribute to their courage and their quiet dignity and Mr Justice Forbes said to the uh, relatives, uh, the victims' relatives, that he said he hoped that their service to the cause of justice would stand as a lasting tribute and memorial to the loved ones they had lost. Nick, thank you very much. 
This has been, of course, one of Britain's biggest murder investigations. But Dr Shipman was only caught when the daughter of one of his victims realised that her mother's will had been forged. Dr Shipman was found guilty of killing 15 of his patients, as Nick has reported, all of them women. The youngest was Bianca Pomfret, who was 49. Most of the rest were in their 60s and 70s. The oldest was 81. Now, our crime correspondent Stephen Cape reports on how Dr Harold Shipman was finally caught. 18 months ago, in this incident room, up to 50 detectives started an inquiry which became Britain's biggest murder investigation. They looked at over 100 suspicious deaths, and in these files, they amassed evidence against one man, a family GP. Now, Dr. Harold Shipman is regarded in modern times as the most prolific convicted serial killer in Britain. I'm sure you've had enough time to take a decent photograph. It was greed which was his final undoing. Kathleen Grundy was the last victim. Shipman arrived at her home on the pretext of carrying out a blood test, but injected her with a massive dose of morphine. He then made an amateurish job of forging the will, leaving her substantial estate to the GP. It said, I want to reward him for all the care he's given to me and the people of Hyde. Shipman then faked the signatures of Kathleen Grundy and two witnesses. It was her daughter, a solicitor turned amateur detective, who exposed Shipman. She was a key prosecution witness in the trial, alerting the police when she became suspicious. We began to think that Dr Shipman had killed my mother, but it was very, very difficult to believe. And we kept going over and over it and thinking round and round it and thinking, well, it must be Dr Shipman, but it can't be. The authorities started the delicate job of exhuming bodies First, Kathleen Grundy in 1998. Others followed throughout that year. Scientific tests showed they died from morphine poisoning. Shipman was interviewed by detectives. Sessions were recorded. They reveal he attempted to lie his way out of trouble, even suggesting a victim had abused drugs. I had my suspicions that she was actually abusing a narcotic of some sort. But the scenario was there, and I, uh, she did have drugs available. She may well have given herself accidentally an overdose. Often Shipman responded with one-word answers, but the police persisted. Into a house, rolled the sleeve in, administered morphine, killed her. That's what happened, isn't it, Doctor? No. In interviews, he broke down, but police suspect it was a sham. My assessment of him, that he was treating this as some sort of game, a competition, uh, pitting his, what he considered to be, superior intellect to, the, to those of the officers who were, who were interviewing him. Captured on home video, 77-year-old Lizzie Adams, a dance teacher until she was murdered by Dr Shipman. The GP was able to kill his victims because they trusted him. The police said Shipman covered his tracks by falsifying death certificates, creating bogus medical records and callously misleading relatives. The only thing I can think of is, is, is an evil, evil man. He's just evil. He's bad through and through. So how many people did Shipman kill over the years? Some speculate it's more than a thousand, but the local coroner thinks there's a more realistic but equally chilling figure. One has to look at the number of cases that the police actually investigated, the 136. I suppose there are some people who have still not come forward, whose relatives have died. Perhaps one ought to look at a total of 150. There are some who are still hoping to discover the truth. This man's mother was a patient of Dr Shipman who died in suspicious circumstances. It's rather like a circle. There's no beginning and no end. Was she murdered or did she die of natural causes? and that is far harder to cope with than, than actually knowing one way or the other. Some of Shipman's victims are buried at the local cemetery, but there'll be little peace for the relatives. Detectives continue to investigate 23 more suspicious deaths. Stephen Cape, BBC News, Hyde. And just a few minutes ago, the police officer in charge of the investigation has been giving his reaction to the verdict. The first is an expression of sympathy from myself and the officers engaged on the investigation, for all the victims, their families and their friends. 
I hope that today's result will help them come to terms with their loss and the circumstances surrounding the death of their loved one. Secondly, I would like to express my thanks to all the witnesses who have given evidence during the trial, as well as those who provided statements but were not called to testify. Families of those murdered by Dr Shipman have paid tribute to the police for their handling of the case. Some are calling for changes in the way the medical profession works. Angela Woodruff, who we saw in a previous report, whose mother Kathleen Grundy was one of the victims, spoke to reporters outside the court just a few moments ago. It's important that the appropriate authorities look to see what lessons can be learned from this case. In particular, we hope that they will consider the procedure on certification of death and whether it should always involve a second doctor who has inspected the medical records, whether doctors should be allowed to be sole practitioners, and the way dangerous drugs are prescribed, held and disposed of by doctors. Sadly, nothing that's happened here, nor can happen in the future, can bring about my mum and all the other victims. We hope we can now have the space and the time to remember my mum as she was, a happy, active, caring, energetic, loving person and we miss so much. To many, Dr Shipman was the popular, compassionate GP. Few of his patients could have known about his past, which included a conviction for drug abuse. Gavin Hewitt has been asking why this professional family doctor turned into someone who preyed on his elderly patients. In the back row of a school photograph stands Harold Frederick Shipman, aged five, a confident boy in a bow tie, Fred, as everyone called him, was clever. He lived here in Nottingham. His father was a lorry driver. He got a place at the local grammar school, and in this neighbourhood, that set him apart. Age 17, Fred Shipman's life was to change. His mother, in her early 40s, was dying of cancer. And here, he was introduced to the influence of a doctor, administering drugs like morphine to alleviate pain in the last days of her life. An ambitious shipman went on to study medicine, but there was a complication. A 17-year-old girl called Primrose, who he had recently met, was pregnant. They married quietly, out of town. The certificate describes her as a window dresser. After college, he became a doctor in Todmorden. He was energetic, certain of his ideas, but he began having blackouts. Then the practice here made a shocking discovery. Fred Shipman was addicted to pethidin, a morphine-like drug. A lot of pethidine that had been prescribed and we didn't know where it had gone. And what did Dr. Shipman say? Well, it had gone into him he because he was dependent on it, yes. So he left town for a drug treatment centre in York, his career damaged. His only explanation was that he had become fascinated with drugs while at college. Sometime later he re-emerged as a GP in Hyde. His colleagues respected his work, although some felt he could be patronising towards his patients and his arrogance irritated them. He had very high opinions and very strong opinions um, and he felt that the way in which he practised medicine was the standard to which all of his colleagues should themselves aspire. In 1993 he set up on his own, having fallen out with his partners. He attracted a large number of patients. He was active in the community. Here, staff at his practice were celebrating, having won a prize for running a children's asthma clinic. He's a character, uh, a good character, a nice man. Um, nice, good family man. Excellent uh, kids he's got. That's part of the enigma of the man. He has a close family, his wife Primrose, and their four children. Only rarely was another side seen. When, for instance, he returned to the house of Winifred Meller, one of his victims. I was amazed that he could be, he could be so cold, he could be so abrupt, uncaring, um, insensitive. He wasn't the least bit concerned um, either for the fact that Mrs. Meller had died or more so for the family. The police struggled to understand the doctor who lived quietly here. Only in one instance did money appear a motive. His victims were women, and he could be rude and dismissive towards them, but his crimes defy easy answers. Those who examined him settled for this explanation, that he was an ambitious, disappointed man, who in some warped way came to enjoy the ultimate power of deciding who would live 
and who would die. Gavin Hewitt, BBC News. A short while ago, the Health Secretary, Alan Milburn, accused Dr Shipman of betraying his profession. He said his thoughts were now with the victims' families. Our sympathies today are with the very many families who have been the victims of these dreadful crimes. As an individual, Harold Shipman betrayed the trust of his patients. He also betrayed the professionalism of our country's dedicated family doctors. I will be making a statement on the implications of the Shipman case to the House of Commons tomorrow. But for tonight, all of our thoughts should be with the victims and with their relatives. What is now emerging is that there were many warnings about the Shipman practice and the police stand accused of responding slowly in some cases to the growing evidence from former partners, other doctors, even local undertakers. Neil Dixon has been looking at who's in charge of monitoring family doctors and what went so wrong in this case. We trust our doctors, we rely on them, we put our lives in their hands. At this surgery, Dr Shipman betrayed that trust and for years he got away with it. The organisations that might have protected his patients failed to do so. It was in Halifax in 1976 that the first clue emerged that all was not well. Shipman appeared in court after his partners discovered his drug habit. He'd been forging prescriptions and stealing the medicine. Dr Shipman was convicted of eight charges of obtaining drugs by forgery and deception precisely the method he was to use to obtain morphine to kill. His case also came to the General Medical Council, which is supposed to protect patients from bad doctors. But the council took no disciplinary action, and Shipman was left to carry on practicing. Those involved must have thought at the time that it was the correct decision. Whether it's a decision we would take today is rather different. It was to be more than 20 years later, when Dr Shipman had set up his own surgery in Hyde, that further warnings emerged. Across the road at this neighbouring practice in 1998, they became suspicious. The GPs here were concerned at the number of cremation forms they were being asked to countersign. The death rate among Dr Shipman's patients appeared to be ten times greater than among their own. We were absolutely staggered. We were totally... We couldn't explain this at all. This, in addition to the undertaker's observations, that they too were attending far more of Dr Shipman's death than any other doctor in Hyde. Greater Manchester Police were asked by the coroner to investigate without alerting Dr Shipman. During this first inquiry, officers did not interview all the doctors at the Brook surgery or Shipman or relatives of the dead. Indeed, the BBC has established that the most basic checks were never made. Most amazing of all, the officers did not check whether Shipman had a criminal record. They did not check his General Medical Council records. They did not even investigate all the deaths that were causing concern. The inquiry left Shipman free to carry on killing. Senior officers admit a check on criminal records should have been made, but insist that otherwise their officers did what they could at the time. We will clearly be reviewing all of the matters in relation to this after this inquiry and any lessons that can be learned will be learned. But we are dealing with a, a, a unique, a historically unique set of circumstances. Relatives of those who died after the first investigation believe the police failed in their duty. When you're talking about people dying unnecessarily, I think the police should have rigor rigorously investigated it um, and more thoroughly than, than what they did. And relatives will also want to know why Dr Shipman's activities were not picked up by the local health authority. He had a conviction for dishonestly obtaining drugs. The health authority knew nothing about it. Five patients actually died in his surgery. The health authority knew nothing about it. And during the mid-90s, 85 more of his elderly women patients died than would have been expected. The health authority knew nothing about it. And it's not just here. Health authorities throughout the NHS are not expected to supervise family doctors closely. Managers are now urging the health department to give them new powers. The health authority have made a number of recommendations to actually improve 
the information flows to a central point, ideally the health authority, so we can more closely monitor what is happening in general practice. More could have been done to protect the patients who came here. Warnings went unheeded and it's clear that the whole system for checking up on GPs is inadequate, not just here but everywhere. There will now be a government inquiry. It's certain to lead to tighter controls on the medical profession. Neil Dixon, BBC News, Hyde in Greater Manchester. And we'll be back in Preston before the end of the programme, but today's other stories now. The former dictator General Pinochet could soon be on his way home to Chile. Several countries, including Belgium and Spain, want him tried on charges of torture and other abuses. But today at the High Court in London, the bid to keep him in Britain was turned down. Belgium says it will now appeal. But the Home Secretary, Jack Straw, has already said he's minded to let the general go on medical grounds. Chilean exiles in London now have little hope of seeing Augusto Pinochet stand trial in Spain. The Home Secretary has said he's inclined to let the former dictator go home to Chile. Six human rights groups took Mr Straw to the High Court. They argued he should have disclosed the medical reports which persuaded him that the former dictator was no longer capable of taking part in a trial. But today, that challenge was firmly rejected. Uh, well, obviously we're disappointed that we haven't been granted leave uh, to challenge the Home Secretary, but we can renew that application before the Divisional Court, and the Divisional Court uh, is available next Monday to, to hear that appeal. There was no word on whether the human rights groups would go ahead with a further challenge next week. The High Court said they had no legal standing. Belgium is another country that wants to put General Pinochet on trial. The Belgians also challenged Jack Straw's refusal to disclose the General's medical reports, and their case was also firmly rejected. We were informed of the High Court's uh, judgment uh, of this morning. We are still examining it, but in the meantime, uh, Belgium decided to appeal to the High Court's uh, judgment. It'll be the middle of next week before the outcome of this new appeal is known. In the meantime, General Pinochet will remain under house arrest. The earliest that the Home Secretary will make his decision will be towards the end of next week. Joshua Rosenberg, BBC News, at the High Court. Ten people have been pulled alive from the Atlantic after the Kenya Airways plane crash. The Airbus, with 179 people on board, came down in the sea off the Ivory Coast shortly after taking off from Abidjan, bound for Lagos in Nigeria. A fleet of small boats has joined the search for survivors. At least one Briton is feared to be among those who lost their lives. In Northern Ireland, the official report on handing in terrorist weapons is due to be published this evening. The First Minister, David Trimble, has threatened to resign unless the report shows that the IRA is beginning to hand over some weapons. Order, order. Questions to the Minister for Education, Mr Martin McGuinness. The new devolved power-sharing assembly sat today. Business as no unusual. The new ministers are still finding their feet. Martin McGuinness of Sinn Féin was facing his first ministerial question time. And of course, the crisis over the decommissioning of weapons loomed overall. These could be among the last exchanges here if the government decides to suspend devolution following the decommissioning report. The Ulster Unionist leader, speaking on BBC Radio Ulster, said there seemed little prospect that the report would contain enough. We've had forms of words uh, over the years. Uh, what we actually need is something more than that. And I think actually it's, it's misguided to think that forms of words will be sufficient here. The, the, the only words that would be treated as important, and I'm not saying that they would suffice, would be if there was a clear promise by the Republican movement to start decommissioning as soon as possible. We promise to work with the Unionist Party, with all of the other parties in both governments, to try to achieve decommissioning at the earliest possible stage. We will continue to do that. As the lights burn late at Stormont, it now seems probable the decommissioning report won't be published perhaps until tomorrow. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Stormont. More now on this evening's main news. Harold Shipman, the Manchester GP, has been found guilty of murdering 15 of his patients and given 15 life sentences. Dr Shipman's surgery was in Hyde in Greater Manchester, where it was a focal point of the community. Our correspondent, Sean Williams, is in Hyde. Sean. Well, Hyde is a small town. In fact, Dr Shipman's surgery was just around the corner, so a lot of people here knew him and trusted him and right up until the end refused to believe he was guilty. They've only had a couple of hours to digest the news and here tonight in Hyde there is a palpable sense of shock. 
Hyde's a busy market town on the edge of Manchester. Dr Shipman was the respected GP of nearly one in ten people here. No one has escaped the impact of his crimes. Do you know where our office is? Victim support's already dealt with more than 200 people, most bewildered and bitter. As news came of more possible victims, the common question was, why here? It's such a small place that, that you always think that these kind of things are going to happen somewhere like in the city centre. Murders only ever happen in other places. So it's, it's quite strange for people to actually take on board that this has happened there. And with such large numbers as well. The local vicar and his family were patients of Dr Shipman for 20 years, a man he trusted. He shares the deep sense of hurt. People are certainly feeling angry, feeling betrayed, and obviously asking questions. And there are certainly no easy answers, and the church has to live with very difficult questions of life and of evil. Age concern is over the road from Dr Shipman's surgery. One of his victims worked in the shop. Her colleagues are only just starting to cope with the enormity of it all. There's, there's been so many people, and so it is, it is very hard to take it in. A sentiment echoed by many here tonight. Everyone's been touched by what Dr Shipman has done. Sean, you spoke understandably of a sense of shock when the verdicts came. What's the mood there this evening? Well, a whole plethora of emotions here tonight. Here, as I said, many people uh, don't believe that he was guilty. He could have been guilty of this. In fact, so sure were they that he was going to be acquitted that the local florist already had orders for flowers to deliver to his uh, home on his uh, on his acquittal when he went uh, back to his home. So a lot of people here feel very betrayed and very angry as well. Questions tonight, questions about the circumstances of deaths in their own families and questions for the authorities. How is it allowed to go on for so long? Now, in order to try to cope, the churches are going to have special services here tomorrow, and there are also a number of helplines being set up. But it's going to take a very long time for this place to recover. John, thank you very much indeed. And while we've been on air, the West Pennine Health Authority has announced that a medical advisor, Dr. Alan Banks, who carried out an initial investigation in 1998 into Dr. Shipman's activities, has now been suspended. Let's go back to Nicholas Witchell, who's outside Preston Crown Court. Nick, can we shed any light this evening on the motives for these terrible crimes. Hugh, motive, that is one of the great mysteries of this trial. The other mystery, of course, how many people in total did he kill? The Crown Prosecution Service has said that it is considering a number of further allegations of murder. But on motive, a mystery that this trial has really shed no light on. In only one case was it a question of financial gain. That was the forging of the will of Kathleen Grundy. No question, obviously, of mercy killing or anything like that. But on this question of motive, it was Richard Enriquez, QC, for the prosecution, who at the start of the trial said these words. He said, Said Shipman killed women because he enjoyed doing so. He repeated the act so often, counsel said, that he must have found the drama of taking life to his taste. He wanted, Mr Enriquez said, to exercise the ultimate power of controlling life and death. Nicholas Witchell at Preston Crown Court, thanks very much indeed. Let's have a look at the weather now with Phil Avery. Hello, Phil. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. Very good evening to you. January has, on the whole, been quite a mild month, month and we've actually seen quite a bit of sunshine around as well. It's the sunniest since 1991, but quite a different message for you, particularly in Scotland and Northern Ireland overnight. Very wet and very windy too. We're also looking at a mild night for most folk across the country. And then tomorrow, that whole band of cloud and rain gradually moving just a little bit further south. Some folks started off with a bright start to the day, but you see how the cloud has spilled in from the Atlantic as we've moved on through the day. And looking towards the north, that cloud obviously very dark and threatening there. And it's produced a lot of rain, as I say, across many parts of Scotland as the day has progressed. In fact, the Northern Isles, just about the only place that's really escaped. Take care if you're on the move. There could be some localised flooding around tonight. And in fact, it, that weather really is going to be around for quite a bit of time. You'll see that as we move on through tonight, this whole area of shading, the heaviest of the rainfall across Scotland and Northern Ireland, really not moving very far at all. But one of the major messages is that it is going to stay mild for England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Northern Ireland. Of course, we'll have more for you in the next half an hour here. Phil, thanks very much indeed. Tonight, Dr. Harold Shipman is beginning 15 life sentences for the murder of 15 of his patients. The judge told him that he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. The relatives of those he killed welcomed the verdict and said they were relieved that the trial was at last over. The health secretary said Shipman had betrayed the trust of his patients. 
You can see more on the Shipman case in a Panorama special tonight on BBC One. That's Mr. Dr. Shipman, the man who played God at 9.30 this evening. It's nearly half past six. There will be an update, of course, as usual, later in the hour. Stay with us. In a moment, it's time to join the BBC's news teams across the